am thrilled uh, to be here just because what you all are doing in practice, focusing on details, is a spiritual truth of our country. You know, we can be Democrats and Republicans, but most Americans are patriots. For over a decade now, good ideas have emanated from the BPC. Thank you for convening this very impressive group of, of thought leaders. Your organization has brought together leaders from across our society to advocate for common sense solutions to our most challenging problems. Because if it's bipartisan, it's much more likely to pass. When you have people philosophically and ideologically in two different worlds, and they put them together on a committee, that committee usually is not very productive. Once we get staffs blending, and John and I, they know that the members are friends and we talk, things can happen. Thank you, Anand, for that introduction, and to the BPC for its important efforts. Thank the bipartisan policy uh, center. You, you guys are great. I have, uh, we all have bipartisan responsibilities to this nation to defend principles that have long made America the beacon of hope. It's going to take all of us to try to turn down the temperature and really focus on what unites us. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Bipartisan Policy Center. Uh, as you probably know, the Bipartisan Policy Center is a mission-focused organization that helps policymakers work across party lines to craft bipartisan solutions. By connecting lawmakers across the entire political spectrum, delivering data and context, negotiating policy details, and creating space for bipartisan collaboration, BPC ensures democracy can function on behalf of all Americans. My name is Zan Fishman, and I am the Director of Energy Policy and Carbon Management here at BPC. And at the energy program, our focus is on driving energy policy that boosts our economy, ensures energy security and affordability, and tackles climate change, all while keeping the US a global leader. And today we're here to talk about critical minerals, which is a burgeoning area of bipartisan interest. And we have actually accomplished a, a fair amount in recent legislation, and there's a lot more to do. Uh, we're very lucky today to have uh, Deputy Secretary of the Interior, Tommy Boudreau. Uh, he's back at Interior after serving for nearly seven years at the department during the Obama-Biden administration, including as the first director of the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. He was uh, Acting Assistant Secretary for Land and Minerals Management, and Chief of Staff to Secretary Sally Jewell. Deputy Secretary Boudreau has more than a decade of experience in energy development, environmental conservation, and tribal consultation. He was born in Colorado, raised in Alaska, and currently resides in Washington, DC with his wife and two children. So welcome, Tommy. Thanks so much for, for being here with us. Um, let's, let's just start this conversation. We're just gonna go back and forth um, just, just big and broad, like we're talking about mining in the future. Uh, and what, what is it that makes it different than our, our conceptions of mining in the past? Can you, can you give us a little insight into how the Biden administration is thinking about the future of mining in the United States? Uh, thanks so much, Sam. And uh, once again, thank you for the invitation to participate in this conversation conceit, convened by BPC. Uh, your work is uh, incredible. You're one of the uh, most trusted uh, conveners uh, on policy issues, uh, precisely because you bring together folks from uh, the full spectrum of opinions. Uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today about uh, mining uh, and domestic sourcing of critical minerals uh, here in the United States. Uh, fundamentally, uh, one of the largest challenges we have uh, on domestic sourcing from public lands, which the Interior Department manages, is um, uh, we literally have a uh, legal and regulatory framework from the, uh, uh, from the 19th century. Uh, and so we still operate under the 1872 mining law, uh, which is, uh, as you would imagine, sort of about uh, prospecting and staking claims uh, as opposed to a leasing process. Uh, and so one of the uh, challenges we have is uh, how do we 
meet the needs of the clean energy economy uh, uh, with domestic sourcing of critical minerals like lithium and cobalt uh, and other materials uh, while managing the potential for uh, conflict that uh, any industrial activity, including mining, has. Uh, and all of the interests that uh, we're responsible for helping meet uh, on public lands. Uh, and so that's why we stood up uh, through the bipartisan infrastructure law, as well as uh, making this a priority in the administration and for the Interior Department, we've stood up an interagency working group, which I co-chair uh, on uh, mining and mining reform uh, and permitting. Uh, and those are uh, our goals, uh, to take advantage of the opportunities that we have for reliable sourcing of critical minerals uh, here in the United States and with our partners uh, and allies, uh, but at the same time, doing so in a way that uh, respects uh, local communities and tribes uh, is uh, good stewardship for the environment uh, and wildlife habitat. Uh, and is responsible. Uh, and so uh, part of what we've been thinking through in the working group is uh, the way forward on all of those issues. We've established a set of principles uh, that guide us. Um, and as I sort of joked, but only half joked, um, I'm not saying we have to revisit our mining laws um, you know, all the time, but maybe every other century, it does make sense to see if they're sort of serving our uh, current uh, urgency and, and priorities. Uh, and so uh, very happy to talk about all of that. And again, thanks, Jim. Thanks so much. Thanks you so much. Yeah, 1872, yeah, 100 and, 150 years. Happy, happy birthday to the mining law that is currently our regulatory regime. Um, I wanna make sure that we're, we're putting this all in context. You know. The word critical is right there in, in critical minerals. Um, but could you just, just talk a little bit about, you know, what, why these minerals are so important to the future of the US? Um, you know, where are the opportunities if we're able to secure a, a domestic uh, sourcing and supply chain of these critical minerals? But, but also, what are, the, what are the dangers if we aren't able to? Yeah. Um, one important lens to view all of this activity through is the climate crisis. Um, the reason that these materials are critical is that they are critical to, among other things, uh, clean energy development, uh, including advances in battery storage, which is uh, fundamental to unlocking a number of different technologies and electrifying the grid. Uh, and so when we're talking about critical minerals, we're talking about those types of materials like lithium, cobalt, uh, and other minerals that feed directly into um, uh, technology uh, being brought to bear to help address the climate crisis through clean energy development, um, but also um, economic advantage for the United States in that technological development. Uh, this is why secure, uh, reliable supply chain on these materials is uh, so important. Uh, the United States, including on public lands, uh, is uh, blessed with uh, a number of these resources, um, but uh, a lot of these materials are uh, currently being developed and supplied um, by uh, countries that um, you know are uh, are more challenging for us in terms of uh, reliable sourcing and. Um, and so you've seen, you know, through a number of mechanisms, the administration put such a large emphasis on uh, critical minerals uh, and sourcing, including uh, last month, uh, the president and secretary of energy announced uh, the American Battery Materials uh, Initiative, which is focused very specifically on uh, these issues of sourcing. And so then that turns to uh, the land managers uh, here at the Interior Department to figure out a path forward to meet those needs, uh, given all of the imperatives around it, um, but to do so in a way that is uh, responsible and comports with 
the expectations of uh, local communities. Right. So, you know, you know, talking about 1872 mining law, you know, my, in my brain, I start thinking, you know, there, there's gold and then there are hills, you know, the, 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 the what of mining seems to have changed drastically, right? We're talking about cobalt and lithium, we're talking about the things needed for technology, for the clean energy technology of the future. And I know people in the energy world have, have historically focused on uh, reliance on other countries that may not be friendly to the United States in terms of oil supply. You know, as we transition more and more into these critical minerals um, that are needed for clean technology, right now we have that same dependence on countries like China, which you know are different than countries in the Middle East, but um, uh, still have a, a less than friendly relationship with us. So, can you can you just talk a little bit about the you know the, the challenges we could face if, if we aren't able to secure that domestic supply chain, whether that's, you know, domestic mining or near shoring, trading more with our allies rather than China. Yeah, absolutely. So the supply chain is important um, in a number of respects. One is um, uh, the reliability. Uh, said you pointed to of you know there is a significant advantage for the United States in developing uh, uh, the technologies to support uh, among other things clean energy technology but also advances in uh, healthcare and other industrial applications so uh, this is about uh, at its core um, you know innovation and the future of the American economy and. Uh, jobs and supply chain here in the United States. And so to have uh, the underpinnings of that uh, susceptible to uh, disruption uh, because of, you know, immediately everyone's mind goes to um, the disruption caused by the conflict uh, in Eastern Europe currently, um, but also, um, uh, you know, the um, uh, kind of national security and geopolitical concerns about uh, sourcing from uh, less reliable countries such as you know, Russia, uh, China, et cetera. There's also an environmental component to it. Um, you know, the production of these materials uh, and mining practices, um, you know, can be done safely, can be done in an environmentally uh, responsible way, uh, but suffice it to say, um, those values and standards are not um, even across uh, the globe. And so part of what our uh, goals are in this space is to, you know, both in the United States and uh, our partners uh, in North America and other allies um, to uh, work together uh, to improve standards for uh, mining as well as respect for local and indigenous communities. Uh, and that is part of what um, a reliable domestic um, set of principles around sourcing uh, can help accomplish too, is uh, safer uh, and more environmentally responsible production as well. Right, right. So, so you know, you're talking about geopolitical concerns, national security concerns, also environmental concerns, you know, domestic economic uh, jobs and growth, um, you know, to me that, that sounds like the recipe for bipartisan interest and, um, you know, the bipartisan infrastructure law, which, which passed last year, created this interagency working group on mining reform that you mentioned, uh, earlier, um, that you co-chair and you guys have been hosting public listening sessions. Uh, how, how have this, those been going? Are you are you hearing major areas of consensus or, or friction? Yeah, so we kicked off the interagency working group last May, uh, and we've had about uh, 20 meetings with uh, the public, uh, as well as states and tribes uh, and uh, uh, stakeholders across the spectrum. Um, we've done 30 additional meetings with individual um, companies, uh, mining operators, uh, as well as uh, environmental NGOs, 
Uh, and then about you know 2730 uh, subgroup meetings to have more detailed discussions about mining operations, uh, permitting procedures, uh, as well as uh, public engagement. So there's been a lot of activity <laughs> since we kicked this off. And a lot of the reasons for that is exactly what you touched on is in order to um, uh, advance um, you know, this important activity around domestic sourcing, uh, we need to do better in terms of uh, community engagement and how we uh, go about environmentally responsible mining. And part of that is this legacy of hard rock mining in the United States going back uh, to, uh, to the 19th century. Um, because of, you know, <laughs> the current uh, law uh, from, you know, 150 years ago, it really was, it really is, and to this day, a prospecting law where you can go out on public lands and, you know, stake a claim. And so that, you know, sort of brings uh, and harkens back to sort of these notions of, you know, grizzled prospectors, as well as honestly, like colonialism and, and folks going into uh, tribal lands and public lands uh, to exploit resources without um, talking to the community, and certainly without uh, benefiting uh, the folks in whose backyard this activity is happening. And so there's just a lot of um, legacy there that has to be as an initial matter brought to the surface. Uh, and then of course, uh, solved for. Uh, so in addition to, you know, the engagement, uh, which is foundational, uh, we've started converting that into uh, action to provide uh, one responsiveness to the input that we've received, um, but two, uh, within our existing authorities, demonstrate uh, progress. Uh, and so one example of that is uh, at the Tribal Nations Summit uh, earlier uh, this month, uh, which brought together tribal leaders uh, from across the country to Washington, D.C. to meet with um, uh, senior officials. You know, and the president himself spoke, uh, as well as my boss, uh, Secretary Holland, about a host of issues. And one of the things we talked about was sort of mining and this legacy. I and mean, we've announced uh, changes to our process to help inform uh, tribal governments about uh, mining and exploration activity uh, you know, on lands that uh, continue to have uh, significant um, uh, cultural, uh, historical, and spiritual importance to them. Uh, and so we've developed a new system to, you know, on the one hand, identify geographic areas of interest to mining uh, and uh, you know, there are cases where tribes see, you know, opportunities as well. Uh, and then to invite tribal governments in early into the process to begin, uh, you know, pre-planning conversations about, um, about the potential. Uh, and then, you know, to work with operators uh, on uh, consultation, both about mining, but also uh, on the back end uh, reclamation work uh, and to provide assurances on uh, uh, potential environmental impacts. Uh, and so that's just, you know, one example where, you know, we're trying to convert, you know, while we're still under the 1872 mining law, trying to convert using our sort of authorities as uh, land managers and stewards uh, to a system that uh, is more transparent, um, more engaged, uh, and better meets our responsibilities, both environmental, uh, but also uh, our trust and treaty obligations to uh, tribal nations. Great. So, so this working group's been, been working and uh, I know the bipartisan infrastructure law requires a report. And I, I suspect many people who are, who've tuned in to this event are, are anxiously awaiting this report. We got, I know, five five more nights of Hanukkah. Some people are thinking about what to stuff their stuff their their stockings with for Christmas. I don't know, maybe a New Year's gift. Any idea when we uh, should be looking out for for this report? And uh, you know, can you give us a sense of, of what what we should expect in it? Yeah. So uh, we're going to have the report out um, in the first quarter of the coming year. Uh, so 
Uh, so yeah, it won't, uh, Santa won't be delivering it uh, uh, next week, but uh, we'll be delivering it soon in 2023. And part of the reason why um, we want to be able to do that is uh, to fully capture, you know, the breadth and depth of input uh, we've gotten. In addition to the, you know, meetings and conversations I talked about, we've uh, we've gotten uh, over 20,000 sort of public comments. Uh, and so we're digesting that as well as working uh, internally with, um, with our own experts to think about, you know, one legislative recommendations for mining reform. Uh, should Congress be able to take up this issue, um, but also uh, what we can do uh, in terms of implementation to have a comprehensive uh, presentation in that regard. So uh, I testified in front of the Senate Energy Committee uh, last week and was asked a question about you know, when's the report coming and, uh, and that's the timeline I laid out and, and the reasons for it. Great. So you're talking about actual implementation, which is music to my ears. Um, you know, when I think about what is it that we need to do you know, there's not a, a, a one, a one, you know, action that, that kind of changes everything in terms of these critical minerals. We need to think about, you know, our permitting process for, you know, domestic mining. We need to be thinking about our, our processing, recycling, royalties, reclamation, community engagement, trade. Um, let's, let's focus just for, for a minute on, on permitting. Uh, you, you mentioned that before. Um, yeah, I know the, the administration uh, backed Senator Manchin's permitting uh, reform uh, legislation that, that didn't, didn't pass in the Senate recently, but it had a focus on critical minerals. Um, what, what can your department do through the permitting process to, to improve things? And, and what do you need legislation for to really get the efficiency we need to have a process that, that you know accomplishes the, the the dual goals of you know enabling us to efficiently build, mine, etc. What we need for a clean energy economy and protect the environment at the same time. Yeah. So one um, one example I use, uh, which I think sort of highlights um, the challenges here, including the 1872 mining law, is. Uh, Beginning in the Obama administration, you know, the administration and the Interior Department um, made a huge push, as I think folks know, on citing renewable energy projects uh, on public land. And we're doing the same thing, you know, offshore with offshore wind. One of the keys to the success of those programs and getting um, projects um, leased and permitted is our ability to do a deconfliction process up front. You know, back in the Obama administration, we called it, you know, smart from the start, uh, which, you know, rhymed and was alliterative. And so it was like double clever, but what it really meant was upfront deconfliction um, to do analysis up front that says, okay, here's the different resource values, both, you know, renewable energy potential, uh, wind and solar, um, but also, um, you know, the potential impacts associated with those types of projects, whether that's on uh, wildlife, uh, you know, local community impacts, uh, uh, cultural resources, et cetera. You know, those whole suites of values that uh, need to be taken into consideration and, uh, and either avoided or mitigated against. And by doing that, um, we're actually able to accelerate um, project development because we've sort of front-loaded um, one community engagement and understanding, um, but also the confliction. And so we've seen a lot of success as a result. Um, fundamentally, we don't have that type of program for uh, critical minerals and hard rock mining. Uh, and so part of what you'll see, you know, in our report is a proposal saying, you know, give us leasing authority so we can run a similar process. Um, absent that, um, you know, we are sort of thinking through what can we do um, within our existing authorities, but also on a voluntary basis, including working with uh, states out west to say, okay, you know, what, where are uh, 
and we've done, you know, for the US Geological Surveys and others, you know, resource assessments to say, okay, here's where, you know, there's lithium potential. What are the other values that uh, are potentially in conflict? What are the communities? Uh, what are the tribal nations we need to work with? And kind of do that in a proactive and more voluntary way, um, even absent a, uh, a formal leasing program. Uh, so that's a lot of what you'll see on kind of the permitting side of uh, how do we sort of advance the ball on all of this, um, hopefully with additional authorities, but even without uh, authorities to, um, again, um, you know, deal with some of the legacy and hard feelings um, that have developed uh, over the past couple of centuries here, um, but also achieve all the goals that we talked about in terms of, uh, of you know, sort of seizing the imperative here. All right, I've got one last question for you because I know you've got to run to the next thing. You know, we've talked about geopolitics, we've talked about climate change and clean energy, we've talked about community engagement, we've talked about regulations and permitting. I'd like to end the discussion talking a little bit about jobs. Um, you know, we need a workforce for this. Um, do we have that workforce in place? You know, what kind of jobs are these? Do they, do they pay well? Do we need more training? Um, where, where should we be focusing on in terms of the actual people aspect of, of this industry? Yeah. Um, so there is, you know, a um, well-developed industry, you know, in the United States as well as internationally uh, for uh, hard rock mining. Um, and, you know, there are, you know, job and economic opportunities associated with, you know, these projects, you know, mining projects themselves. Um, but where uh, we really see kind of the multiplier effect, if you will, from, uh, from this activity is uh, supporting that entire supply chain uh, and domestic manufacturing associated with, you know, uh, tech, uh, bio, uh, tech as well as clean energy activity and be able to um, have reliable sourcing that can feed into uh, those industries as well. And so, yes, you know, the mining sector, you know, provides employment opportunities, um, you know, as with any sort of industrial um, development, there's a lot of advantages associated with that, including, you know, jobs into, you know, rural communities uh, where, uh, a lot of this activity takes place, um, but even more so uh, feeding into the supply chain and uh, burgeoning industries where we see the United States having uh, a, a uh, comparative advantage on the global stage. Uh, so yeah, mining specifically, but really the multiplier effect from having uh, domestic sourcing, uh, reliable supply chain and unleashing um, uh, our advantage in, uh, in uh, a number of different sectors. Well, Deputy Secretary Boudreau, thank you so much for your insights, for your focus on this. You know, it, it's clear from your comments that the administration is focused here and that there uh, is real bipartisan potential uh, for action. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you. Um, and if you have any closing thoughts, uh, now would be a great time. And, and after this, I'm gonna turn it over to the, the panel. Yeah, so again, thank you so much. Uh, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the conversation today. Uh, this is, uh, you know, one of the top tier issues facing our country right now because it is so fundamental to, uh, among other things, stepping up to the climate crisis. And so uh, thank you to the Center for uh, Convening Experts to have this conversation and agree totally um, this is an area where um, while there's challenges, there is a lot of common ground to move forward together. Uh, so thank you, uh, and please enjoy the rest of the conference, and I'll be uh, looking forward to um, uh, continuing this conversation. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague and friend, Dr. Danny Broberg, to introduce our next panel. Thank you, Zan, uh, and thank you, Deputy Secretary, for your leadership. Uh, we're going to transition to the innovation panel now for this event. Uh, my name is Danny Berberg. I'm a senior policy analyst here at EPC, and I have the pleasure of moderating this panel here today. Um, as the previous fireside chat touched on, 
shifting to a clean energy economy is going to require a dramatic increase in our supply of critical minerals. Uh, and addressing supply chain constraints and geopolitical tensions means that the US needs to refocus efforts on a durable supply chain that includes more domestic mining efforts. But it's important to know that the technologies and frameworks for the modern mining industry are very different than mining efforts in the past. And this panel is here to explore how and why. Uh, so in just a few minutes, I'm going to start some moderated discussion. Uh, and I want our listeners to know that uh, we'll have some time for audience questions towards the end, which you can submit through the YouTube chat or by tweeting um, at hashtag BPC live. Um, so before I get into some questions, I'm going to quickly introduce our panelists. Um, so first, we have Abigail Wolf, who is the Vice President and Director for Critical Mineral Strategy at SAFE, which is a leading think tank here in DC focused on energy and transportation policy with the goal of bolstering America's econ economic and national security interests. Um, her work at SAFE, she, she leads the center's efforts to secure responsible supply chains for critical minerals and the materials necessary for energy and technology innovations of the future. How are you? Uh, great to have you, Abby. Uh, next up, we have Tyree Gray, who is the president of the Nevada Mining Association, where he serves as the public voice and face of Nevada's modern mining industry, which has the goal of educating citizens about the importance of domestic mining to achieve our nation's green energy ambitions. He advocates for policies that emphasize uh, environmentally responsible and sustainable mining activities within Nevada and abroad. Welcome, Tyree. Todd Malan is our last but not least panelist. Uh, is the, he is the Chief External Affairs Officer and Head of Climate Strategy at Talon Metals, which is a base metals company in a joint venture with Rio Tinto to explore the high-grade tamarack, nickel, copper, cobalt project located in central Minnesota. Uh, at Talon, Todd is responsible for external engagement and climate strategy, including carbon mineralization, operational emissions, energy, and the green nickel product franchise. Welcome to Todd. Um, so kicking off our questions now, uh, we'll start with Abby. Uh, Abby, you know, SAFE's done a lot of work in this space, uh, including um, developing a comprehensive critical mineral strategy for the US. Um, could you tell us a bit about SAFE's work and what your organizational um, views are around sort of the most promising directions to head down for mining in the future? Absolutely. And thank you so much, Danny, for having me here today. Uh, it's really an honor to be on this panel with uh, my esteemed colleagues here today, and really great to hear Deputy Secretary Boudreaux's uh, remarks earlier with Zan. Um, so SAFE is a bipartisan, nonprofit organization. We're mission-driven. We were really started in an attempt to diversify our energy and transportation fuel sources for the transportation sector, and an attempt to get away from our over-reliance on oil which, as we've seen most recently, uh, can be manipulated with prices either through geopolitical conflicts, as Russia's invasion of Ukraine and war in Ukraine has shown us, but also through um, OPEC-manipulated oil markets. So since the early 2000s, we've really been pushing for the diversification of fuel sources for the transportation sector, uh, including electrification. Uh, but we've also noticed that as we've been pushing for this greater electrification in the transportation sector, that we might be inadvertently pushing pushing ourselves into another critical dependency when it comes to critical mineral supply chains and the complete dominance by the Chinese Communist Party, all the way from mining to processing to battery manufacturing, even to recycling. So uh, our focus, we really approach this from a national and economic security lens. We want to make sure that uh, our supply chains for uh, the minerals of the future, which are, as Deputy Secretary Boudreaux laid out, going to be critical for everything from batteries, but, you know, in our view, very importantly, the automotive sector, and make sure that you know our, our key industries that make up the backbone of our economy here in the United States, our tech-driven democracies, can't be used as political pawns if uh, you know we get into um, some sort of uh, disagreement with Beijing. So uh, we're focused on diversifying supply chains. And for the future of mining, we see responsible mining and transparent supply chains as really being the way to diversify those supply chains. Because where critical minerals are coming from right now, it's ostensibly very difficult to compete on cost because people are you know, degrading the environment or exploiting workers in a way that would not be tolerated if it were done in the United States or among some of our like-minded partners. So we see the future of mining as being responsible and transparent and look forward to the panel discussion to talk about that more today. Wonderful. 
Thank you, Abby. Um, so responsible mining um, and sort of a hint there about what uh, mining in the US should and uh, can look like. Um, so now I want to turn to Tyree, um, who uh, puts a face on that effort. So, um, you know, this event, Tyree, is focused on mining opportunities in the future. Uh, tell us a bit about Nevada's history with mining and what the Nevada, uh, the Nevada Mining Association has done to ensure mining benefits flow directly to Nevadans. Happy to do so. Um, good morning, everybody. Such a pleasure to be here, and thank you for the opportunity to come in and speak a little bit to you today. I think it's important to recognize that if you care about the environment, or you care about, or you have a social conscious, um, you want mining to happen in Nevada and across the U.S. Um, Abby pointed to um, some of those uh, talking points around the fact is is that where we are currently sourcing the vast majority of our minerals are from countries and or states um, that are not doing it the right way. And we do it here the right way in Nevada and frankly across the US. I mean, though the mining activities in Nevada date back to the 1800s, I don't wanna leave people with the impression that somehow um, the only piece of regulation that applies to the mining industry was actually written within the 1800s. Um, we know that every piece of legislation that has come um, to bear over the last uh, 50, 60 years um, all applies to mining, whether that be NEPA, Clean Air Act, Resource Conservation, Clean Water, Toxic Substance, um, I can go on. And so we want to make sure that people have an understanding that though there's an 1872 mining law that deals with kind of land use, um, the environmental side of mining and the regulatory side of mining is very well, I mean, regulated. And in fact, here in Nevada, there are over 20 different agencies, if you count in the federal agencies that have some level of oversight in mining. And so to talk a little bit about Nevada's history in mining and where we're going into the future, again, it dates back to the 1860 to about 1865 when the state um, actually became a state. Um, and one of the things I tell people all the time is I make no um, excuses for what happened in the 1860s, uh, let alone the 1960s, um, from an operations perspective and or from a social perspective. We wouldn't be having these conversations, uh, frankly, today. Um, so, I mean, as a conscious of the United States and the business operations have evolved, I think it's important that we incorporate that technology and the way that we do things today just differs, right? And so I think it's important that you continue to highlight what that looks like. In Nevada, there are roughly about 40,000 people that rely on the, the mining supply chain. And one of the things that I frequently uh, will say kind of just to illustrate uh, for people is when we're talking about green technology and we're talking about where we're heading in the future, um, talking about everything without thinking about, um, like talking about particular minerals um, is kind of like talking about a peanut butter and jelly sandwich without thinking about the bread. Right, you have to have base minerals um, because when you look at an EV versus a gas powered vehicle, there's really no difference in the construction, um, except for how we decide to power that vehicle. And in many cases, that vehicle will require more copper, um, more of those base minerals, gold and silver and different things like that. And those minerals are helpful in our transition as well. So I don't wanna get too focused on just a certain set of minerals, but really be able to address, I mean, the whole suite of minerals. When you look at Nevada's mining regulatory structure, um, we kind of have that smart from the start idea that, I mean, Assistant Secretary Boudreaux was speaking about. Before a single shovel hits the ground here in Nevada, you have to plan for reclamation, closure. Um, you have to be able to think about how you're going to return that mine site as close as possible to its original, um, its original landscape and makeup. You also have to pay a bond in order to make sure that you can cover those reclamation costs. And so if you can just think about it, I mean, everybody on this panel, hopefully most of us are old enough to remember like Kmart. I mean, you think about if Kmart had to think about um, and plan and set aside money for um, its eventual demise. Uh, I think, I mean, again, we wouldn't have uh, building structures that are kind of empty around because there would be a requirement to turn them back and make them um, into in public land use. 
Um, and so, I mean, I'm excited to have a conversation around um, the, the panel. I don't want to take too long, but I just think that it's important to recognize that um, I'll start as I, excuse me, I'll finish as I started. If you care about the environment, you care about what's happening socially, um, you want mining to happen here in the U.S. Extremely well put, Tyree, uh, and can't resist a good PD&J pun. Um, trying to find the extended metaphors here, but um, we'll transition to, to Todd now, who, you know, if uh, Critical Minerals is the peanut butter and jelly sandwich, maybe industry is is the milk to to, to sort of support the uh, digestion of, of the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> but, um, so Todd, uh, Talon Metals has a number of innovative mining and processing efforts underway that have caught the attention of DOE uh, for funding under the bipartisan infrastructure law. Could you tell us a bit about what Talon is up to and the kind of innovative approaches we should be looking towards? Sure, happy to. Uh, and I really agree with Tyree and Abby's uh, comments earlier. Uh, and I'll see whether I can come up with a really good metaphor. I have to apologize. I'm uh, with Tyree out on the West Coast and the sun is coming up. So that's not a solar panel on my head. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, what Talon Metals is doing is trying to demonstrate that the United States has significant battery material resources within its mineral endowment. We have a group of almost 50, what I call nickel hunters based in central Minnesota that are out there looking at um, making sure that, that, that we can actually try and identify the high grade nickel deposits that we found in Minnesota. You also see this in uh, Michigan. So the Eagle Mine is the only high grade nickel deposit that is actually now being mined. Um, but unfortunately, because we don't have the processing in the United States, that nickel has to be sent to Canada and then on to Norway to actually end up at the battery grade level. Um, and I think that's what we're incredibly uh, grateful for that in the um, bipartisan infrastructure law and in the IRA, we now have the, the wherewithal, the resources to fulfill what is this bipartisan consensus that we need to decouple the battery supply chain uh, from China and, and have it be a domestic and ally-based uh, supply chain. Um, it's it's really remarkable, though, that you now have this consensus in Congress and 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 with the administration about that that imperative. But they're putting resources on the table, and we were fortunate enough to be selected for one of the first uh, awards in the battery battery processing uh, area, uh, battery, battery mineral processing area in the bipartisan infrastructure law that um, was announced earlier this year. So we're one of 20 companies that were selected um, and we're building a uh, nickel processing facility as well as uh, other byproducts like uh, iron for LFP batteries, uh, cobalt and platinum group metals that are in our ore body in Minnesota, but we're gonna process that in North Dakota. Um, the couple comments here, you know, the U.S. does have very significant resources in the battery supply chain. All you have to do is look at the U.S. Geological Survey's recent reports and understand that the U.S. actually has quite a bit of what we need in the ground. It's a matter of getting it out and doing it responsibly, then having the processing cap capability to do it here. One of the things I'll talk about in, in, in Minnesota that we're really fortunate of uh, uh, at the Tamarack Nickel uh, uh, Project is that we have high grades, up to 12% nickel in what we're seeing in our core samples. Why should the public care about high grade? Because high grade means high concentration. That means we can actually go after in an underground mine very selectively and surgically, grab the high grade material, take it out in a responsible way, uh, and still make sure that we're protecting the environment. So um, some of what the United States has is not only just the right materials, but in a form that is really quite helpful to um, uh, making sure that we disturb the land as little as possible. So we're really excited about the prospect of building a self-sufficient uh, nickel supply chain uh, in the United States. 
uh, with our partners at Tesla. Um, we have an offtake agreement with Tesla, which we announced earlier this year. And uh, um, we're, we're excited to be able to prove that the United States actually has the wherewithal and the geology to be able to uh, go to toe to toe with China. Great. Uh, well, so, uh, you know, you touched a little bit there on sort of selectively and, and targeting, uh, you know, targeted engineering on, on making sure you get more with less. Um, that's a super exciting area for innovation in this space. Um, another area that I think a lot about is, you know, when people think of mining operations, they, they tend to think of these huge open pit mines um, that take up a huge geographical footprint. Um, but there's actually a lot of really interesting innovative approaches um, that can make use of, of older mines that um, maybe got clon uh, closed up. And, you know, a question maybe for Tyree, um, you know, could you tell us a bit about efforts in Nevada to sort of remine or, or produce more from dormant mine sites? Yeah, happy to discuss that. I think um, when you look at the rich history of mining um, in Nevada, um, there allows for a reimagining um, of an industry that existed before modern technology. And the ability to use modern technology to address um, prior mining activities, whether that be from a reclamation um, side um, and or to remine old tailings dams is something that is truly exciting. And because of the technology that we use today from an extraction point, there are even opportunities sometimes where you could actually extract at a greater level than you did when the um, mine was developed in the early 1900s or whatever the case, because our technology didn't exist. And I think, I mean, speaking about that technology is a wonderful opportunity to kind of also piggyback on what I mean, Assistant Secretary said um, around not jobs in the mining sector, but actually careers. Um, in Nevada, the mining sector has the highest salary um, wages of any industry within the state. We have a payroll of close to $3 billion. Um, dollars. And we only have about 3 million people in Nevada. So we're relatively small. And, and so people think about Las Vegas when you think about Nevada. Um, but there are 15 other counties that exist within the state that rely on mining um, and really to be its bread and butter, if you will, to keep the sandwich uh, puns going on. Um, and so, <laughs> so I think when we look at um, our remining efforts um, and the ability to be able to go and a remind, but also go back and reclaim old sites. Um, when we talk about what possible legislative changes could happen around there, I think there's a unique opportunity to consider um, some good Samaritan legislation that again allows for companies to be able to go into old sites and reclaim these old sites and see if there's anything of value, but not necessarily take on, um, again, responsibility for, I mean, actions that may have happened, I mean, in the early 1800s, because again, our technology is just different today. So, I mean, I think, I mean, our ability to um, have all of these, and I always say we have every ist you can think about on a mine site. I mean, hydrologists, geologists, <laughs> all these scientists' jobs um, to make sure that we go out and we are able to recruit a young, um, energetic workforce. And I tell people, if you love the environment, like come work for mines. Like we we touch the environment on a day to day basis. And I mean, it's a great opportunity for you to be at the table um, and being able to to help to ensure that mining activity is going on in the way that you can support in a way that you um, can you know, be, pr be proud of as an American. Great. And I, you touched a little bit there on uh, Good Samaritan legislation, which um, I appreciate you mentioning that that is a bipartisan bill in the Senate. I believe sponsored by Senators Heinrich and Risch, and um, totally agree that that's a great area for, for some bipartisan progress, uh, potentially in the next Congress. Um, so in a second, we're going to transition to audience Q&A. So keep dropping your questions in the YouTube chat and using the hashtag BPC Live on Twitter. Uh, but maybe one last uh, sort of moderated question I'll target towards Abby. Um, you know, what other R&D should we, hasn't been mentioned here today that we could maybe touch on? 
So a lot of different things in the R&D space are making me really excited. Um, Todd and Tyree did touch on them a little bit, a little bit when talking about reprocessing existing mine waste. Um, but a lot of that innovation is happening in the processing space and also just the focus on full value mining. You know, in the past, you would just go out and you'd have just your copper mine or just your nickel mine or something. But now we're really focused on, you know, what are sort of the trace elements that you can also get out of those mines? You have, you know, Rio Tinto going back and getting lithium out of a borate mine. Uh, you have tellurium being mined out of a copper mine. You know, what what are sort of the 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 other things that we could be extracting simultaneously and making it more economic for companies to do that too? And so the advances in processing are really big there. The other thing that gets me really excited as a geology nerd are the advances in geologic mapping that we've been seeing. People using really sexy things like artificial intelligence and machine learning to try to find those really high value and as Todd was saying high grade concentrated deposits because one of the things that we don't really have in the United States is a very good sense of exactly what our mineral potential is and where the reserves really are and those reserves as as we know on this but there are known economically viable deposits and it really wasn't until the bipartisan infrastructure law that the U.S. Geological Survey was given you know an additional boost to go out and find and map our lands much better so that we can make better land use planning decisions. Um, and then finally, you know, uh, when we're talking about disturbing the land as little as possible, you know, it, it's not necessarily new, but people have been doing in situ mining for some time now too, depending on the particular chemistry of deposit or uh, the type of um, element that you're after. But, you know, and, and what that involves is really no land disturbance at all. Uh, they, they put a couple wells in, they inject, you know, uh, you know, fairly benign solution and to try to dissolve the metal, you know, in, within the ground and then pump it back out. So, you know, very little subsidence associated with that, you know, very little land disturbance associated with that. And with intense water monitoring, you know, making sure that, you know, everything is supposed to be, you know, as it is um, outside the site of the mine. Um, and then, you know, advances in recycling too. Um, and any advances that we make in minerals processing, let's all also make this point, it is an advance in uh, battery recycling as well, because minerals pro raw material excuse me, raw minerals processing and spent battery recycling are two sides of the same coin. They go through the exact same chemical processes, the hydrometallurgy to melt down and isolate those materials that we're trying to get at. And so, you know, any advances in one will be an advance in the other. And there's a lot of, a lot of really innovative companies right now that are looking for ways that are less energy intensive, um, have less effluent at the end, you know, things that are going to be contaminating the environment at the end. And that's all very exciting. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so now transitioning to a, a few minutes of, of audience Q&A, uh, we've received a question or two about um, sort of the community engagement component of this. And, uh, you know, it was something we heard a little bit uh, from Deputy Secretary Boudreau about, um, and, and we all know that this is a key priority for the Biden administration, um, that, you know, infrastructure projects funded by the federal government will need to be held to the highest standards of community engagement. Um, Maybe maybe I'll, I'll point towards Tyree. Uh, could you give us any examples from Nevada about um, you know what has been done to sort of improve the community engagement process around mining? Um, I, I know that there's sort of relevant tribes in Nevada that you all cared a lot about. Um, could you give us some examples there? Yeah, happily happy to speak about that. I think I mean Nevada's unique in that we're roughly 80% federally controlled. So therefore it's important for us to establish relationships uh, with our neighbors. And those tribes are truly our neighbors in the areas in which we tend to operate. Um, Nearly every mining operation um, that's a member of the Nevada Mining Association has a tribal outreach person actually on staff. Um, and even the association itself is, has a tribal subcommunity, and we're engaged in conversations uh, with tribal leaders uh, on a day to day basis. Um, but I mean, the truth is, is that no two people ever see, um, think exactly alike. And I mean, but for conversations, um, that's the only way that we're able to get um, these sovereign nations to support 
our programs. And some of the ways in which you do that is sometimes community benefit um, agreements, um, but there's also needs to be a recognition that in most areas where mining happens, um, you're talking about relatively economically depressed areas. And so being able to bring in workforce development, being able to bring um, in opportunities, not just for work, but for contracting, for small business ownership, for, I mean, infrastructure projects, um, hotels, different things like that, I mean, can really be... Um, I mean, again, that tide that kind of lifts all ships in those areas. And so for us, it's important that we're having those conversations, uh, particularly myself. I go out and I visit with tribes, um, I mean, um, relatively frequently. And I mean, again, I mean, because of the permitting process, and when we look at the permitting process that takes so long, um, what can happen a lot of times is by the time the public is made aware of a of the permitting process, the permitting process can be eight years in <laughs> in practice, right? Um, and so there could have been conversations that happened eight years ago, and even consider our system of government. Um, if there was a conversation that happened eight years ago, we'd be talking to different leadership. And so along the way, um, I think it's important that there's some level of consistency in order to, in, to speed up the permitting process so that you're having conversations with the people who are still in leadership by the time the project um, comes uh, comes along. So, I mean, there are revamps that we can happen, but please know that um, for any of you who have any concern, I mean, here in Nevada, we're having those conversations and we're working diligently to make sure that people are um, engaged, again, from the start of the project, not just when um, the NOI or the rod is pulled. Yeah, excellent. I mean, great, great points there. And it's it's an ongoing process. It, it needs to be a continual engagement with communities. Um, does anyone else on the panel have, have sort of reflections on this? Yeah, Todd. Yeah, Danny, uh, I'd, I'd love to chip in on this. And I completely agree. Um, I think in our instance, you know, one of the things that we've been doing for a number of years now is quarterly community meetings with uh, uh, coupled with an open door policy where people in the community can stop in, have questions. We're trying to also really be out in the community and available to answer questions. Um, and um, also, it's important to be an incredibly good listener and think about what people are saying their concerns are. In our area in central Minnesota, it's a very water rich environment. Um, uh, they don't call uh, Minnesota the land of 10,000 lakes for nothing. Um, and, you know, we got a lot of feedback from the community that they were worried about um, sulfide bearing ores being processed and the tailings being stored in that area. Um, again, we can't help where Mother Nature puts the high grade nickel deposits, but we can think about different ways of approaching uh, uh, tailings and processing. So what we ended up doing, and, and this may only resolve some concerns, not all concerns about mining in, in that region, is moved our, our processing and tailings to the drier environment and to an industrial site in North Dakota. Um, so hopefully, you know, that idea of being a good listener and then taking action on people's concerns is something that, you know, the mining industry will adopt as a as a best practice. And I, I know I see that in Nevada and other places uh, as as well um, on tribal sovereign governments and, and First Nations. Uh, one thing that I think um, people should keep in mind is um, Canada has a really interesting uh, area of practice with First Nation governments and uh, First Nation companies not only engaging in making sure that mining is um, going, not going to negatively affect the economy, uh, uh, the environment, but also asking for and taking a seat on the economics of a project. So you see uh, tri tribal sovereign governments in Canada now actually taking equity stakes in projects or requiring certain specific and measurable commitments to employment for tribal members or training or uh, procurement. And I think that the United States can learn a lot from Canada in terms of how tribes are getting involved in not just the regulatory assurance of environmental protection, but also getting a, a place in the economics of a project. Um, and I think that's really important. And I think President Biden's been very, uh, a strong on this in terms of uh, emphasizing that he wants tribes to be part of the, the energy transition and part of the benefits, uh, not just part of the due diligence. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Todd. Well, we are reaching the end of the hour here, um, but uh, I will summarize sort of a number of questions we've gotten around um, sort of policy challenges. We, we've touched a little bit on policy in this panel, but um, you know, going into the 118th Congress, I think there's a lot of opportunities here. Um, you know, I, I might ask sort of a lightning round question here in this last minute that we have, maybe maybe just 20 to 30 seconds on where you see the the lowest hanging fruit on policy, and maybe maybe we'll go Abby, then Tyree, then Todd. Lowest hanging fruit. Oh man. Okay. Well, I, I think there have been a couple of bills that have already been introduced that we could really, uh, well, that should be passed and that should be built upon. Um, we've been talking about how to make mining more responsible. And a lot of that has to do with money. A lot of that has to do with it's expensive to do things properly. And so, you know, Senator Wyden had introduced a bill that sort of helped to incentivize, you know, and give out, uh, I believe it was grants for more responsible mining practices. Uh, we should also be thinking about incentivizing exploration in the United States. In Canada, they have an exploration um, tax credit. And, you know, we had within IRA and IJA, like different tax credits that were given, but that's sort of one piece that's missing. Um, and then also I want to hammer home on trade. You know, we talk a lot about recycle, uh, excuse me, on responsible mining among allies. Uh, Secretary Boudreau uh, talked about, you know, the, the interagency working group for responsible mining, but we need enforceable mechanisms for that responsible mining. And so sanctionable, enforceable trade deals among our allies will be one way that we we can do that. Excellent. Thanks, Abby. Tyree? Yeah, I think I can sum it up into kind of like two high-level principles. Number one, supply chain. Um, I think it's important to recognize that right now we are mining minerals in, um, in Nevada and across the U.S., and we're needing to ship them elsewhere to be processed. And so we need to pay attention to that supply chain and that smeltering process and the process and I mean getting it to battery grade and or to getting it to commercial grade, that's that's in, it's important. Um, the second I will say is, I mean, just permitting. I mean, again, I think that from an economic perspective, um, it can't take 10 years to permit a mine. By the time the mine comes online, um, the needs uh, have completely shifted and changed, right? Um, look at a project like uh, Lithium uh, Lithium America. Um, it's been in the process for eight to 10 years. And had it already been online, say, for instance, five years ago, it would already be meeting some of the demand um, to help to lessen our dependence on um, other countries. And so, I mean, I'd really focus on those two areas um, of making sure that our supply chain is robust, um, but also making sure that the permitting process is streamlined so that we can actually get the help and get the critical minerals that we need in order to transition. Um, and so I encourage anybody, I mean, if you're concerned, if you uh, have any questions about what we're doing here in Nevada, please take a look at our website, nevadamining.org. Um, we're happy to, uh, we have all the information you could ever want um, on that site around process, um, about what we're doing here in Nevada and what I think maybe some of the things that we're doing in Nevada could be applied uh, nationally. Thanks, Tyree. Uh, and Todd? Yeah, just real quick, Danny. Uh, I think that the most important thing next year is going to be the implementation of the IRA and the, the tax incentives that are built into the IRA. There are some that are trying to, I think, undermine the intent of um, the IRA and try to uh, undermine the, the benefits that are intended to build up the domestic supply chain and 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 strengthen domestic mining, uh, and I really hope that the Treasury Department and the IRA and the Biden administration reject those efforts. Uh, it was not the intent of Congress to help the Russian or Indonesian mining industry, um, and it, depending on how that law is implemented, that could be the effect. And that'd be a real shame. Um, we want a robust um, supply chain. We want uh, the automakers to be able to sell more EVs. But the intent of the 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 law was to get the uh, the the full supply chain up and running from mine through to recycling. And we need to make sure that that law is implemented faithfully. Wonderful. Well, thanks, Todd. Thank you, Abby, and thank you, Tyree. Uh, I think we've reached the top of the hour and. Um, you know, we, this, uh, this discussion on sort of how mining in the future can be different and should be different than mining in the past. Um, a lot of exciting innovations discussed here today. Lots for Congress and the administration to work on in the 118th Congress next year. Um, so again, thank you to the panelists. Thank you to the Deputy Secretary for his words here today. And uh, from, uh, from us at BPC, happy holidays to everyone. Thank you. Thanks.